Um, right, so all I said was, what is a symplectic four manifold? So it means you have some special uh, two form, uh, which is a volume form, on, which when you weigh it with itself, you get a volume form. So um, in CP2, which is what we talked about last week, that's a four manifold. Um, and it has a special two form called um, the Fubini Studi form. Um, and this is something you can write down explicitly in local complex coordinates, um, but it has a symplectic structure and it's just this two form. Um, and so, uh, so this is the setup. So you have some geometric structure on this on this manifold, and it has this um, pair like this sort of pointwise positivity condition. So everywhere on the manifold, when I wedge it with itself, I have to get something that's positive everywhere. So that's some, some strong geometric condition on this two form. Um, but it it lives in. Um, oh, I should say that. Uh, um, it's a closed two form, right? Which means that it defines some cohomology class in H upper two of your manifold, right? And the second, um, the second condition means that, um, well, I take a wedge product in cohomology. What I should get is some top dimensional element of the, the cohomology ring here. Okay, so there's some there's some cohomology class associated with this two form. When I wedge it, I get something that's non-zero in the top dimensional cohomology of that four manifold. Um, and because it lives in this, um, it's, a, it's a two form. If I have some surface, so if K is a surface, um, you get some well-defined uh, integral where if I integrate omega over k. Um, and this is the, um, the symplectic area. Okay. All right. And that this is actually just something that's well defined on cohomology. I have a pairing just by like I put h upper two and I um, paired with uh, h lower two. Sorry, of x cross h lower two of x, let's say z coefficients um, to r, there's a pairing, where I just take this, so there's this well-defined pairing on cohomology and homology where I just take a closed two form and I integrate it over some closed surface representing a homology class. And this area, this integral only depends on the cohomology class of omega and the, and the homology class of this surface that I'm that lives in my four manifold. So this is just the basic pairing on a homology and cohomology. Um, any questions? Um, all right, so um, now let's say, so uh, K is a symplectic surface if um, omega restricted to k is positive or I or equivalently um, omega restricted to k is an area form on k. Okay, so that's like again like a pointwise positivity condition on this um, on this of this this geometric this omega on this surface k. Um, and as an example, um, complex curves in CP two are symplectic. Okay, so this just. Uh, happens from the definition of the way, well, the way that this Fubini Studi form works. Um, it's uh, to be a complex curve means that you have um, your tangent space at every point is a complex line. And this form evaluates positively on all complex lines. So this means that complex curves are symplectic in CP2. And it's true in any Keeler, Keeler surface as well. But um, 
So the, the last week I was talking about complex curves. Today we're going to be talking about a generalization, which are symplectic surfaces in more general four manifolds, which are symplectic four manifolds. Um, so we're trying to we're, we're generalizing what I talked about last week to some larger class of things with um, where my geometric structure is now a symplectic structure and a symplectic surface, as opposed to a complex or a complex, you know, complex surface and a complex curve. Um, okay. And so the um, and so in particular. Um, the symplectic area of the symplectic surface is positive. Right, because um, integrating this two form over my surface, if my if I'm symplectic, that, that's everywhere positive. So I'm integrating something, some positive function over a surface, so that integral has to be positive. Um, so, um, there's a, a, a conjecture which I'll, um, which is what this talk is about, which is the, um, the symplectic con conjecture, which is that, um, symplectic surfaces minimize genus. In their homology class. So last week when we talked about the Tom conjecture, that was a statement about complex curves in CP2. And we said that those surfaces whose genus is given by the, this classical degree genus formula, their curves which sit inside this four manifold, they have some genus. And among all the surfaces that they're homologous to, they have the smallest possible genus among all those surfaces, smoothly embedded surfaces, they have the smallest possible. Um, Genus. And then there's a generalization known as the symplectic Tom conjecture, um, which says that the same thing is true for symplectic surfaces and symplectic four manifolds. So it's um, uh, the sort of the natural generalization where you know complex is replaced by this more general category of symplectic. Um, and um, so, so Peter, in, implicit there is what you haven't said, I think, which is that homologous symplectic surfaces have the same genus? Uh, yes. Right. Um, right, so let me, uh, I just want to give an overview so we can, yeah, we can get the calculation. So, um, so let me just say that, um, Or maybe I have particularly bad eyesight, but I'm having a hard time reading what you wrote. On the right or the left here? Uh, spe especially on the right, but even the left. Okay. Um, I think it's just the... Uh, maybe. Um, is it too small or... It just, just write a little bigger. Okay. Write a little bigger, yeah. Because, uh, I mean, if you keep moving it, then we don't see the hole. Right. Um, okay, so I want to... Uh, um, what do I want to say? Uh, okay, so, so to my symplectic form, there's a, there's a characteristic class. So you want omega with lives in H upper two. So the first trend class of this uh, symplectic form, um, it's really the, there's an associated almost complex structure, but I'm just gonna say there's a, there's a particular two dimensional cohomology class associated to your symplectic structure. Um, and um, back one is that, um, 
if k is symplectic, um, then the Euler characteristic of k is equal to c1 paired with k minus k squared. So recall um, from last week, um, and this is a this is like a generalized degree genus formula. Okay, so um, this is this is the right generalization of the degree genus formula for complex curves in CP two that I talked about last week. That the Euler characteristic of this surface is determined by evaluating a cohomology class on that homology class and subtracting off the homological self-intersection number of that surface. So it's purely determined by algebraic topology in this case. Um, and so going back to Dave's question, um, saying that any two symplectic surfaces that are homologous have to have the same genus. Well, this right-hand side of this equation only depends on the homology class of K, right? So the formula for the Euler characteristic uh, only depends on the homology class of K. It doesn't depend on anything else. So that the, the Euler characteristic or the genus is well-defined. It only depends on this, this homology class. So I have a question. Yes. Is it known that every homology class in a symplectic four manifold is represented by a symplectic surface or does the conjecture only apply to homology classes that have this symplectic surface represented in them? Uh, yeah, not every class has a symplectic surface. Um, uh, yeah, that, that doesn't have to be true. And so the conjecture says nothing about those classes. Exactly. Um, Right. Well, yeah, you get some, you get some lower, yeah. Um, yeah, so this conjecture um, only, yeah, it just says those classes which are represented by symplectic surfaces, um, that's, that's the smallest possible genus in that, that homology class. Um, um, Okay, and so the, the real thing, so the, the way that you prove this is you, well, you just prove that there's an inequality um, that for that which symplectic surfaces are, make it this inequality sharp. So, Suppose you have some surface in a four manifold, so in a symplectic four manifold, and it has positive symplectic area. So that when I integrate omega over it, I get a positive number. So that just depends purely on its homology class and the cohomology class of omega. Um, then there's an inequality, which is that the Euler characteristic is at most C1k minus k squared. Okay, so. Our, and so this, this immediately applies this previous statement because, um, well, and then, you know, but, uh, well, let's see, I just erased this symplectic Tom conjecture, but um, if this is the max Euler characteristic or the minimal, which tells you the minimal genus in that homology class, um, and symplectic surfaces make that inequality sharp, then they have to have minimal genus in their homology class. Um, So saying that it has positive symplectic area, that's that's the same as saying if you pair it with with um, omega that it becomes out positive, right? Yep. Right, yeah. So symplectic means that it's that you know omega is pointwise positive, so you integrate, you get a positive thing. But that integral can be positive even if it's not pointwise positive. 
So, so it proved, you've proved the symplectic tome conjecture then. Yeah, th yeah this, this is what that proves, yeah. Um, well, this was already known 20 years ago. Um, so, oh. yeah. Um, so uh, this statement of this, this is what's called an adjunction inequality. Um, um, can I ask a stupid question? Yeah. Uh, does any surface that's in the homology class of a symplectic surface has positive symplectic area? If it's, this, wait, if it's homologous to a symplectic surface? Right. Yeah, that's yeah. positive symplectic area because that's... Oh, like, because the evaluation there, yeah. Okay, because it's only... Right. You know, like the symplectic area only depends on the homology class. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Um, so I should have said that um, the. Uh, it was stupid. Okay. Yeah. So um, this, this conjecture, the, the symplectic time conjecture, was proven about 20 years ago by Ojwat and Sabo um, using cyber wit invariants. Um, and uh, it's kind of, it's actually something that was proved in various stages. Um, and because of the way that gauge theory works, there's sort of various homological conditions that you have to worry about in order to make the arguments work. And so there are sort of it actually proved in various different cases. Um, in particular, uh, it depends on um, well whether this this k squared it was positive or negative. It depended on whether something about like the um, how big B H two was of the four manifold. It um, you know sometimes things work for you know things where the order characteristic was non-positive. So there were various sorts of cases that actually sort of um, different arguments work to prove this, this one theorem, but um, from the trisections perspective that I've worked on, um, you actually just get one straight up nice easy inequality here that doesn't depend on any conditions on X or K or um, you just get some straight up inequality and um, it's a simple calculation that symplectic surfaces maximize that, make that inequality sharp. So uh, it immediately proves the symplectic time conjecture. Um, right, so this is. Uh, so, but hold on. Um, just yeah. probe that logic a little longer. So, the theorem you wrote on the right hand board yeah. is a priori possibly stronger than the symplectic time conjecture. Right. And that. This theorem on the right hand board was that also proved by Oshvat Sabo or not necessarily? Um, or is it in fact equivalent to the symplectic time conjecture? Well, I mean, if you read through, like, you know, their result is kind of complicated because it talks about like various conditions on like uh, chambers and basic classes and things. Um, this, you know, it, it, you know, this follows from all the various cyber witten results. Um, so you don't get anything strictly stronger than what you get from cyber witten. Um, and it's not, uh, it's not implied by the, it, I mean, it's, it's actually stronger than symplectic time conjecture because you get. Um, uh, you Specifically might, because there might be classes with positive symplectic area, but no symplectic representatives. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. um, you can also kind of extract things about. Um, so, I guess, is no, yeah. no, the, the, the no. question is it, the statement that you made about uh, classes with positive symplectic area, does that follow from 
various uh, cyber Witten or what, whatever gauge theory results uh, or not. Does um, this thing about positive symplectic area? Uh, right. If you, if you have something that's positive symplectic area, but you don't know it has a, a symplectic representative, does, do their methods still apply or not? Um, yes, because all you need to know is that this is a basic class, right? So, um, you know, it, 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 their, their statement is about like cyber witten basic classes, mm -hmm. which is a, a statement about this cohomology class C1 and not a statement about the homology class of the surface, I think. Um, I may have missed this, but is it known whether there are, whether you can have a class with positive symplectic area, but no symplectic surface, or is that open? Um, uh, I, oh, okay, yes, that, that's an interesting question. Um, so, uh, I don't think it's I don't think it's known. I think it's possible you can have um, uh, um, yeah yeah I, I don't think it's known. And so and I, I so it's possible then from what I gather that it could be that every H two class in a symplectic four manifold emits positive symplectic. No, 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 sorry. No, no. Is no, that no. something like positive cone or something? What's that? You have that thing in that, that, that kind of a notion in. There's the, um, there's the symplectic cone, which is uh, every Durham class that can be represented by a symplectic form. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like you ought to be able to make examples just because the a junction formula would force the oil the characteristic to be four or something like that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, right. So I think you could say something, maybe something a little weaker, like like if you have a minimal genus surface, right? So if you have a surface that makes this inequality, so you're in a class where this is like possible. I guess. Um, can you can you replace it by a homologous symplectic surface? Right. So yeah. So Mike's right that you could you could sort of you know just this formula could give you something or the characteristic for. Um, so it's not there's no there's no connected oriented surface that has or the characteristic for. Um, but you could ask if I have a class with or the characteristic two and positive symplectic area, is there a symplectic sphere in that class? Um, and that's, uh, um, that's related to the fact of whether I, I asked, is, is there, I asked Melissa this over on email over the weekend, but is every um, knot which maximizes the slice Benneken invariant quasi positive? Um, so you can, you can actually turn it into a statement about um, knots in, the, in S3. Um, so uh, um, yeah, that's an interesting question, Joe, and and everyone else. Um, yeah, actually, uh, uh, Tianjun Li and uh, his father actually defined this notion about sympathetic genus that you uh, at least you need to run through all the canonical classes of uh, possible omega to um, that 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 would give you some kind of a necessary condition for some. Uh, some minimal genus to be uh, attained or something. Uh, and yeah, but I'm, I'm not sure whether uh, that that requires B plus equal one. But, um, yeah, I think I know the paper you're talking about. Um, I mean, they do do something for B2 plus is equal to one and can determine the symplectic cone. Uh, and also some part of the curve cone or something. Yeah, you can you can start playing these games where you start using this inequality and, and thinking about like if I have a fixed four manifold, I might have different symplectic structures with different C1s and 
how do what what do sorts of um, you know uh, you can kind of um, uh, there are all sorts of games you could play to, to deduce some information. Um, and for the most part, I don't have anything new to say. I mean, a lot of this, most of the sort of adjunct inequality stuff is 20, 25 years old. So yeah. a lot of these games were playing, you know, uh, a while ago. Uh, we, maybe we're going too far afield here, but I mean, there are very few symplectic spheres of non-negative uh, uh, yeah, of non-negative self-intersection. They're basically only in, in a limited class of four manifolds. So, I mean, if you had a class where the adjunction formula would say it had to be a sphere and it has non-negative self-intersection, but you weren't in one of these special four manifolds, then that, then that would be an example. Uh, do, those, that's not do those manifolds exist? So, 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 so like, you have to, for, to have a sphere of non-negative self-intersection, you have to be at a blow-up of, of CP2 or a world surface. Right. Um, so if it, so, if you're in a four manifold that isn't one of those, which you know is most symplectic four manifolds, um, and you had a class, I mean, I, okay, I don't know. I, I'm not totally sure you can make it work, but it, it, if the yeah, I guess self intersection was non, if the if the adjunction formula gave you two as the Euler characteristic, uh, and so it would demand that the thing be a sphere. Um, um, yeah, I, I don't know. But this is maybe too much. Yeah, junction formula cannot tell you that the k square must be bigger or equal to zero, right? There's still many uh, negative uh, spheres. Maybe I just misunderstood what you said, Mike. Well, I, I, okay, so, so take a, I mean, take a class in a symplectic form in a whole that isn't, you know, of non negative Kadara dimension in our language. So, okay. such that a squared minus c1a is two. Okay. Um, and such that the area is, uh, and such that the area and the self intersection are both non negative. So, I mean, if you can, maybe you can do some algebra to find such a class. Oh, okay. Um, I, I see what you mean. Um, and then, for, you know, for somewhat more sophisticated reasons than the other things we're talking about, that, that would not be. Representable by a by a symplectic surface. Yeah. Okay. You're right. Uh, I think uh, so. Uh, maybe one of Ron's earlier paper. I mean, show well because this uh, Barlow is it called Barlow surface or something? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. yeah so that's uh, that's that's uh, the homology seems to be the same as the CP two blob nine points or eight points. Eight points. Eight. Yeah. A points, then uh, yeah, then then that thing definitely have uh, a lot of these classes. Yeah, you just take that uh, self intersection, you take that uh, class that has a self intersection one, and then maybe you top, you just, I mean that that class. Would yeah, 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 right, right, yeah, yeah. If you multiply it by a large enough amount, then the then the self intersection becomes bigger than the. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, of course, it has a different turn class, right? But. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. But but uh, I mean the turn class term gets drowned out by the self intersection term if you multiply the. Yeah, I think you can manipulate. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, if Mike, if you actually do come up with an example, it would be very interesting. Because um, it would it would I could I could use that to to find some knot which maximizes the slice penny inequality but is not quasi positive. So from from examples like that, uh, from surfaces like that. Yeah. So if, if you if you had an example like that, um, I could use it to come up with some counterexamples in knot theory. Um, so anyway, it's worth it's oh, worth thinking so about. Would it generate it to some have some singularity or what? Where where would the knot come from? Um, well, it's sort of implicit in my proof of this. Uh, this year, um, I mean, I could. Uh, um, I don't. I don't like. Let, let's keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well. Uh, okay. Um, all right. So. Uh, 
where do you, okay, so where did this, how much you try and think about proving this? So I'll just give some like rough geometric uh, oversight. So um, um, I think last week I, I sort of, um, so, uh, so let's start with, we, we started with CP2 last week. Um, and CP2 has this natural uh, decomposition into three pieces. Um, so there's, there's this moment map, which, I don't, um, which I'm not going to explain if you don't know what it is, but um, there's a sort of natural way to map CP2 into R2 and have it come out as a right triangle. Uh, and in fact, it's a simplex. And if you look at, you, you take the very gender subdivision, uh, um, what you do is you split it into three pieces. Where um, these are all if you morph it to a, a, a bi disk in C2. Okay, so. I cut it into these three pieces. Are they diffeomorphic or biholomorphic to a poly disk? Uh, biholomorphic. So yeah, this is just the, I mean, this is the affine chart on CP2. You have three affine charts and you just take the, the unit by disk in each of those affine charts. Got it. Um, so you, you split it up into these three pieces. Um, okay, and so, uh, all right, so how should you think about this? Well, um, this is sort of, like this can be approximated by a four ball, right? So if I take a two, two disk times a two disk, then if I were to smooth out the boundary here, I just kind of, I, I have a corner right at this point here. And if I just smooth everything, that gives me a, a, a four ball with boundary S3. Okay. And um, like the unit S3, Sitting inside C2 as a natural contact structure where I look at, um, so I look at the tangent space to S3, and that's a sort of three vectors which span that tangent space. And then what I can do is I can multiply each of those vectors by i, because I'm sitting inside C2. And so that's what this j does. It takes every, it takes every tangent vector and multiplies it by i in this, in this C2, because I can identify the tangent space of C2. And this gives me some um, hyperplane field, like a two-plane field on my S3. So I get some nice, the, the complex geometry uh, of C2 induces something called a contact structure on my S3, and it's a plane field. Um, and locally, it's something that's non iterable So if I have, so locally, So you, can you, should, you should swivel your laptop a little bit. Did I move it? Okay. Um, so locally, this, this plane field looks like the kernel of this one form. So this is my z-axis. So along the z-axis, I just have these planes, which are, um, so everything on the right falls out, and it's just um, some planes that are oriented up. And then as I come out on a ray, we right here, I start to twist. So there's a kind of a, a coronal vector, a normal vector, and then let's see. Let's 
me see, uh, for these planes, kind of easier to see this if I draw like the, the co-oriented vector. So there's, there's a plane field that kind of starts over here, it's pointing out to the right, and then as I, as I go through the origin, it's pointing up, and then as it goes back, it's pointing to the left. So these plane fields, are, there's a plane field that's twisting, and this is, no, this is a contact structure. Um, and there's a theory of, uh, um, so this is some geometric structure on, on a three manifold. And then uh, you can look at knots which are transverse to this contact structure. So what that means is that um, if I have some knot K sitting in my three manifold, I want that at every point, my knot is uh, positively transverse to this contact structure, All right? So at every point as I travel on this knot, I'm puncturing those hyperplanes in a positive direction. So the Z axis in my first picture would be a transverse knot because I'm everywhere moving positive to that plane, but you might have some more complicated, um, it, you can have a much more complicated knot going through the, 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 the three manifold, yes. Um, Um, and Bennekin's idea is that uh, from the early 80s is that these things, the transverse knots, are really you should think of them as braids or braid closures. So these are transverse knots are equivalent to braid closures minus um, something called positive stabilization. So let me explain what that is. So let me here's an example. So here's the trivial braid on one element, which closes off to the unknot. Um, you can stabilize by adding an extra strand and an extra twist. So um, I could add. Um, two strands and a single twist of those two strands, which still closes off to the end knot. And I could add an extra, I could add, there's two different ways I can add that extra twist. I could add a positive twist, which rolls to the right, according to the right-hand rule. And I can add a negative twist, which rolls to the left. Okay, so some chirality here, going back to Logan's talk. Um, okay. Um, and there's an essential invariant. Okay, let's see an example. Let me give another. Uh, I have a right handed trap. Okay, so on the left there, you have two parallel guys you're starting with. Here? Yeah. Yeah. This is just a um, one strand on the. Like a trivial, right. and, then, and then what's the statement here? I'm sorry, I, I got distracted. I'm just describing stabilization. Right, so how did you go from one strand to two strands? Uh, I just added a strand and a twist. You added a strand and a twist, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so this is like a, uh, this corresponds to a Reitermeister one Oh, movement. I see, I see, I see what you're saying. In he's, a he's not it? talking about closures, he's talking about just braids. Right, yeah, okay. Okay. Um, it's like stabilizing a braid. Yeah, yeah, this is braid stabilization. Yeah. Um, so these, these knots turn out to be, you can always turn them into braid closures, um, but it's not well defined because you might end up with, um, and, you know, it might be a stabilized version of this. You might end up with two things that are related by some stabilization like this. Um, so, you know, these all three of these braid closures close off to the end knot. Um, and this one closes off to the right handed trefoil. Um, and there's an invariant called the self linking number. Um, 
which is um, So if you want to look at an end strand braid, so some, some beta in the end braid group, um, and you look at its closure, the self-linking number is an invariant of that braid closure, that transverse knot you get, and it's, it's a numerical invariant, and the formula is given by negative n, which is the braid index, plus the ride of that braid beta. So I'll, I'll describe this in some examples. So um, here, the self-linking is I have a one-strand braid with no crossings. So it's negative one plus zero is negative one. I'll write this in red. When I do a positive stabilization, my self-linking, well, I have a two-strand braid, so I have these two, these two strands coming in. And I have a single positive twist here. So I, my right of this is one. So I have a single positive twist. Whereas if I did this negative stabilization, I have two strands, but I do a negative twist. So I get a minus one, and my self-linking number is minus three. Okay. So I said that you know this should be an invariant of transverse knots. Um, so I should get the same if, if two two transverse if I get two break closures are the same transverse knot, I should get the same invariant. So um, doing this negative stabilization, I change the invariant from negative one to negative three, so they can't be the same. Um, and, you know, I go from, when I do this positive stabilization, it doesn't change. It's not a proof that they're the same, but um, I'm telling you they're the same. Um, and then in the case of this right-handed trefoil, by self-linking, I have a two-stranded braid, but I have three positive crossings. Is one. Um, okay. Um, all right. And then there are these two, there are two important inequalities. So there's it's known as the like Benikin's bound which is that the self-linking number of K is less than or equal to negative the Euler characteristic of a cypher surface. Reposition re, re your laptop. Oh, sorry. Right. <laughs> so there's some, you get some bound on this, this, this invariant in terms of a cipher, the, the Euler characteristic of a ciphered surface. So for the unknot, it bounds a disk which has Euler characteristic one. So the self-linking number has to be less than or equal to negative one. So this, which is, we, we got something over here on this unknot which maximized that um, minus one. And then for the right, the right-handed trefoil, that, that knot has genus one. So it bounds a surface of Euler characteristic negative one. And so the self-linking number is less than or equal to negative negative one, which is one, which is exactly what we got in this example here. Um, and there's a slightly stronger inequality. Where instead of a ciphered surface, where um, so if a ciphered surface that which sits inside S3, you, you look at a, um, a slice surface um, S in the four ball. So what that means is that I have my S3 as the boundary of the four ball. I have my not K sitting on the boundary here. And then in the interior, I have some smoothly embedded surface in the four ball. So there's some surface in there. So uh, 
if uh, if this surface F is a, is a symplectic surface, uh, would this equal inequality become equality? Yeah. So in this case, if, if this is symplectic, um, yes, then this is inequality. Exactly. Um, and in particular, if, like going back to the previous question, if, if if K is what's known as a quasi-positive knot, then you can construct explicitly a symplectic surface that it bounds. Wait, so is what Wei was saying, uh, sorry, so that means that if, if you're not bound to symplectic surface, then it has to sort of be, it has to be used slice bending and maximizing? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, if you, if you bound a symplectic surface, uh, you're quasi positive. Right? Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. Um, cool, yeah, I'll just think. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. Okay. Um, okay. All right, so, so the, uh, so we, so we get these, there's this, there's this bound relating this invariant of this transverse knot to some surface that bounds in the four ball. Um, and so the, um, let me go back here. The idea for the adjunction inequality okay, um, is that I should have maybe Anyway, so um, so you take a trisection and you cut it into these three pieces. You take a trisected four manifold of x omega, okay, and you can cut it into these three pieces where um, there are contact structures on the boundary of each of these sectors. And you care, you have some surface K that sits inside this four manifold. So here's my K. And it intersects. Um, and if you're lucky, um, it's going to intersect the boundary along a transverse knot or transverse link. And the essential idea is that. Um, we're going to try and bound how much Euler characteristic ends up in each sector, right? And because the, the total Euler characteristic comes by, I have some Euler characteristics sitting inside each of these sectors, and then I, I glue them together along a boundary, but that you can kind of keep track of that. And so we want to use this um, slice Benekin inequality in each of these sectors to kind of bound how much topology ends up in each sector in terms of that self linking number. Um, and uh, um, which is the essential idea. Um, making that precise is a little tricky, um, but uh, and you know it's it's three fifty. I don't want to go too much longer. Um, it would be totally fine, I think, to talk for at least five more minutes. Um, yeah, and useful to say, and and maybe ten more minutes if you want. I mean, you can give an hour long talk. Yeah, we usually do, actually. Um, okay. Uh, so let's say that, um, so is that, is that the basic overarching strategy of what I want to do is that, like, I have some surface, I care about its other characteristic. I want to, I want to sort of, I'm going to, somehow cut everything up in a way where I can try and bound how much, how many handles end up in each one of these sectors. And what I want to do is I'm going to use this slice Benekin inequality 
um, to, to sort of like give me a bound on each sector in terms of the self-linking number of some link that I get on the boundary of each sector. Um, so let's say we're going to define D lambda is equal to K intersect D lambda. So this is, um, right, so this is, this sector is Z1, Z2, Z3. This red piece in here will be D1, D2, and D3. So I'm just taking the sort of two-dimensional piece which sits inside each sector. Um, and K lambda is the boundary of that. So it's a knot sitting inside the boundary of this piece here. Um, Um, and so, like, if K lambda is a tran is transverse, and the self-linking number of K lambda is less than or equal to negative the Euler characteristic of D lambda by the slice bounding community quality. Right, so I have some I have some bound on the on the topology of this surface in terms of um, this uh, this transverse knot here. Um, let's see, how do I do this in the simplest way possible? Um, I want to give you something that's true, but like I don't have enough time to define everything. Um, I'll just say that um, the sum of these self-linking numbers um, is determined by um, C1K and K squared. Um, Plus uh, um. okay. Let me just say, so I uh, I don't have time to sort of do this in, in detail, but right, so I'm going to try and how do I get to the surface? I, I take these three surfaces with boundary and I stick them together. So if I'm going to do an Euler characteristic, Euler characteristic computation, I have to think about what is my overlap, right? So I want to, I want to put all these pieces together. Um, and it turns out that what I get is there's the, like this, these terms in the injection inequality corresponding to the algebraic topology, which are C1 and K squared tell me exactly what the sum of those self-linking numbers have to be up to exactly the correction term I need, which tells me what, I, how, like, what happens when I try to glue these surfaces together along this blue piece here. Um, so it turns out that uh, you get a very nice statement, you know, this sort of principle of um, trying to bound how much topology ends up in each sector actually, actually works out and you can use this Use this contact geometry to, to, to translate between all these different perspectives in a way that um, uh, you know, it's sort of, you know, I don't have time to talk about this now on top, but um, you really can, in this case, get genus bounds on a closed surface by getting by looking at genus bounds in each of these sectors and then gluing them together. Um, and that's the essential idea. Um, so I think I will uh, end my talk there. Um, uh, great. Gordon, you going to chair the question session? So, um, 
Yeah, any questions? Like, I have a question. So when you cut here, you're cutting the surface really along some trivalent graph or something? Yeah. Yeah, and then, I mean, just give a few words about where is the, where, what, what happens then? Um, well, yeah, I mean, so, well, I think I had a, surf, I had a, um, a sphere. You know, I have, yeah, a trivalent graph with two, two uh, vertices and three edges. So those two vertices would go to the center and each one of these edges would go to each one of these three sectors. So I'd have like a, um, a D1 in here, a D2 in here, and a D3 out here. Um, so what you can, you can always, you can just sort of, by kind of isotoping everything around, you can assume that um, that you intersect along some two, 2D points. So, uh, Oh, this is a, yeah. Right. So any two of those give you uh, any pair gives you a knot in one of this that gives you your transfers knot. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. So like yeah. So like this knot here is is this thing. You know. It's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the, this knot here is you get some. You know, abstractly there's some circle and it maps to some some knot in this. In right. This example here. And then going on the outside, you get some other knot that maps to this three mantle here. Right. And then somehow what happens, what, what happens when you, I mean, what happens in this, in this uh, ad, adding of those inequalities? Like what's the main point? Um, well, the sort of- if I, was, if I was reading your paper and you wanted to point me out to the like deep point in the proof, So what do you mean a deep point in the proof? Well, somehow, where, where, where is the hard point? Um, well, uh, I mean, I haven't even mentioned the hard point. In this right, talk, yeah, right? I know, you haven't. I'm trying to get you to mention it. <laughs> what do you mean? But I, I, don't know, I, don't, I don't know what you're referring to. It, it doesn't matter. I just wanted you to tell us something more more about how the contact structure. Right? I mean, there, there's, there's, there's two issues, right? There's doing it in CP2, and then right. it's for general manifold. So for CP2, you had to do a bunch of, you know, you have to argue that the surface can be put into some nice position, right? And that the, oh. what's, what's the... Um, but let's suppose we've done, we, we've put the surface in the nice position. So it now already intersects in transverse braids and everything's good, right? Uh -huh. After that, is it just bookkeeping or is it like? Right. Well, the, the, you don't always get transverse knots here. Okay. So there's a sort of like, I kind of like, you know, there's a sort of enormous like secondary thing you have to do, which is that these, these knots don't end up being transverse on the nose. Uh-huh. have to like, um, there ends up being these clasps that you kind of have to dig out a little bit. You kind of have to do some extra topology to fix some things here because you don't actually end up with transverse knots. Um, and that requires managing the, comp the contact geometry in a subtle way. Um, and uh, um, I mean, yeah, so you, you have to. Uh, there, there's, I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I didn't want to say because there's a lot of topology I just haven't sort of told you exists. Um, mm -hmm. Just sort of trying to give you a very sort of very uh, overview of idea of what's supposed to happen because there's actually interesting topology to each of these blue pieces here that you have to, or, or handle bodies and they have some interesting fundamental group that you have to worry about. Um, uh, I mean, you have to uh, use your Weinstein theorem thing. That the, the Weinstein trisection oh, thing too. We kind of already did that, right? In order to project it into three pieces, and so that it's yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But, so this like to get a, to get a decomposition like this it re relies on um, you sort of. I, I was talking about branch covers last week from. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's a decomposition here, and you just pull it back to X in the, in the right way. 
I remember now, yeah. The, the geometry, the, the point is that there's some nice, to decompose it into these three pieces where you have contact structures on the boundaries and um, you, uh, um, yeah, and everything sort of, these trisections work very nicely with branch covers. So everything that works in CP2, you just pull it back in a very nice straightforward way to an arbitrary symplectic form manifold. Sorry, I'm not getting I'm not getting to go down this hint. So. so when you say the branch cover works very well with the trisection, you mean so this trisection in CB2 is really the trisect uh, the standard trisection. Um, yeah. And, and the center is really like the Clifford torus or something like that, right? Yeah, exactly. So when you when you say it works very well, uh, so when I have a branch covering, then the branch locus is usually a uh, a surface uh, as well, right? And uh, so you first manage that surface to uh, be transverse to the uh, trisection. Yeah. And so you. Uh, yeah, you manipulate the, the um, right, so you have the surface, you'll put it in some nice position with respect to this trisection where um, uh, everything's either a disc or um, a cone on a ray and a trefoil. Um, and so, once you, uh, and like, you just keep pushing things through the, the center in some nice way until it gets, it can sort of get very complicated, but in each piece, it's as simple as possible. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, so, uh, so for example, if I, I only, uh, care about, uh, the CP, the, the, um, the Tom conjecture in CP2. Yeah. So, uh, so is it, uh, special about, I mean, Cutting it in three pieces, or I can actually cut it into more pieces as long as they are uh, just balls. Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, I, it's you know, um, you need at least three um, because uh, um, you want you want each of the pieces to be convex in some sense. And so, if you just had two, one would have to be convex, and the other would have to be concave. But it turns out mm -hmm. if you have at least three, you could have this triple convexity. And if, right. you, have more, if you have more pieces, they would also be, um, everything would be, con you can make everything convex, so it would work. Um, doing that, to, but I have never really thought much about what you get by cutting into more pieces. Um, generally, you would uh, sort of, you could put like, so CP2 as the handle decomposition with three handles, a zero handle, a two handle, and a four handle. Um, you could cut it into a piece where every handle has its own sector. So all the zero, one, two, three, and four handles have, live in their own sector in some way. You could simplify it like that. So that would, if you have a, a four manifold with a lot of handles, you could have, you know, a, a really sort of a whole bunch of pieces. Um, but I haven't really thought about how you, what you would do with that so actually, uh, so there are uh, some people who uh, who investigate, uh, for example, what are the full packing of uh, open balls into CP2, for example. If you uh, pack a couple, for example, you can pack four open balls uh, fully into uh, into CP2. So uh, it's a classical result. Okay. If you do it that way, then uh, you just take the four, the four ball closures, then uh, clearly they are all convex. And um, but you can actually pack. So the easiest uh, packing is uh, if you pack uh, n square balls. But uh, there are no uh, very explicit description of what the boundaries would look like uh, when you have uh, more than four balls. Uh -huh. But for example, for four balls, then you, you, basically know what the boundary behavior would look like. Uh, but but um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if that use any new information at all. <laughs> so are, are these symplectic? I mean, are these like the the bi discs that I was talking about? The what? Yeah, I was talking about those like D cross D. Is that what you mean by a symplectic ball? No, it's uh, really a B four. 
I see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, your your uh, decomposition is probably a sympathetic D two times D two, or some kind of convex domain. Right. So it's really a ball. So then it's a. Uh, uh, maybe it's even easier to manipulate, but I don't. Know. Yeah. I see. And also, uh, I mean, from what I see, so if, if I uh, want to go to higher dimensions and I have something that can be decomposed into several um, balls or, you know, when the boundary are convex and very simple, then uh, if I apply the same technique, uh, you probably don't get, so I think you can get everything except the K-square because there is no K-square in higher dimensions. Because the, uh, I mean, this uh, self-linking number and the pairing with trend number, that probably can be get uh, from this technique even in high dimensions. But you don't have k square, but that you should probably have uh, something to replace that. So then, but I'm not sure if that's intrinsic or not. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know what uh, I don't know what the right generalization of this. I mean, whatever the um, Whatever the right generalization is to complex surfaces in CP3 um, is not what not true, or at least not what you'd expect. Yeah, probably you would want to consider hypersurface, maybe. Yeah, but I I, I think that like you can um, like hypersurfaces in CP3 don't have minimal topology. Um, oh, I, yeah, I don't think you can get some kind of a minimal top. Yeah, I don't know what you can get because uh, I don't know what is the term that you would put in the k square. It would be something that just involve uh, the normal bundle of the embedded surface, but uh, the normal bundle of the uh, yes. embedded surface or uh, hypersurface would not control uh, the ambient topology uh, as strongly as in four dimension. So there would be some loose ends that you would not be able to say anything, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I have, well, like the other characteristic is C2 and it'd be determined by like um, yeah. C1 in the class of the hyperplane divisor or something. Uh, um, yeah, I think you would get something like the linear, uh, linear combination of C1 squared and C2, something like that. It would, you probably would be able to say something about C1 plus C1 squared plus C2 has some range. I don't know, maybe. Um, yeah, I mean, like, so the self-linking number is just sort of an abstraction of a relative C1 or... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that would, yeah, that would basically give you this C1K or something like that. Um, right, and the K squared is something just like, you know, it, has, it just tells you about the hyperplane divisor. That's really what that's telling you. It's uh, I I would I would think of it as a C one of the normal bundle. Well, are you also thinking of like K squared is just like like um, if I had a curve in CP two, yeah, and I like pushed off, I took a second curve, like um, you know, you just. Uh, you get some finite number of points on the curve, which is a divisor, right? It's the hype, you know, some like multiple of the hyperplane divisor. Um, I think I will anyway. Uh, there's probably there, I mean there's, there has to be some generalization, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks. Any other questions? Thank Peter one more time. Thank you guys. Hi. Thanks for the talk. Yep, thank you. Yeah. Peter? Yeah. Uh, can you give me a, a talk with where you actually tell me the details that you then tell here. I like, remember you talking to me about this like two or three years ago, but I forgot about how the, you know, the, the kind uh, of. Uh, sure. 
Yeah. I mean, I don't mean public talk, just. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, you know, I have a, this memory of, of what you did, and I'm trying to read this. The I was trying to read the paper you sent me, but I'm okay. too old to to try and push through it without some guidance. So. Okay. Well, I, do, I kind of cheat in that paper and just say it's. <laughs> Right. It's just like the first paper. Yeah, yeah. So, and then I, I remember you telling me kind of what the point was of the proof in the first paper. Uh -huh. but, but I forgot. I can't. Okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I don't mean now. I mean, okay. some sometime. You know? Okay, yeah. Yeah. I so, was trying to get to, to say a few sentences of, of the type that, that you talked to me about two or three. Yeah, so, so right, I understand so, it's like two, you. You have to introduce too much stuff. Yeah, so there's like the, the, the simple argument, like when you can make everything a transverse knot or a transverse link, it's really easy. You just, it all follows, you just do it like you do a, um, you can just, you can compute the self, you know, you, uh, um, you can see that you can see all the, to, the like topology of the surface from the trisection. You can compute. K squared, you can compute its intersection with C1. Mm -hmm. um, so you can get that and relate it to the self-linking number of those knots. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you, when you can't make it a transverse link, you end up with these clasps mm -hmm. and you have to kind of, you have to like, you have to do some trick where you kind of like cut out a one handle and you get a ribbon surface and you can still, but still bound the self-linking number using the slice Bennekin inequality. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, I see. So you reduce everything to the slice Bennekin inequality. And, yeah, yeah. And then that was, that's gauge free, right? That's what? That's gauge theory free. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you use S invariant, yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of remember, and I remember you explaining some stuff to me, but I forgot what. Okay, it's okay. Okay, I, th I thought you were kind of leading me to say something for the group, and I was like, uh, uh, yeah, it's hard to say. I know it's hard to say. Yeah, I, I didn't know whether there is something if you took five more minutes you could actually say, but not. No, I mean, like the the, it's not much harder in this general case than in CP two. Right. It's just that. In CP2, your all your pieces of your trisection are tori, so either a solid torus. So, but that has that is a Belian fundamental group, right? And then if you go to a higher genus, now you have a non-Abelian fundamental group, and mm -hmm. you have to do some much different tricks in order to like deal with that non-Abelian fundamental group because things don't work right up to homotopy. But you kind of had to work around it, but it's not so bad. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, if you can remind me of that, the, the CP2 thing, then I could try and actually read the, the new paper. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Cool. Thanks. Bye bye. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Melissa. I was thinking about a lot of things, but I think everything is half baked. So I was wondering if at some point you want to just like um, sit down and sort of write down everything you know about. <laughs> uh, I mean, to answer your original question from the email. Oh, the, the, um, well, yeah, the like question. if you maximize life spending it. So now I see where you're coming at, like why it's related to everything you were talking about in this talk. But there are a lot of things, I guess, related to mostly Plumbinus guys invariant that are like not quite detecting quasi positivity, but I'm wondering if any of those things could help, like. They can obstruct quasi positivity, of course. Uh -huh. um, and then there's also experimental stuff like Lenny and a student years ago just like mapped out the like botany of like a whole bunch of knots. Yeah. Um, um, so I forget what, so what is Olga's thing? Um, it's just like, it's just looking at the cycle in Havana homology where everything is like concentric. So you have a braid diagram, right? Closure. 
And then you take the resolution that's grade like, so it's a bunch of concentric circles, and uh -huh. then label them all with um, X or V minus, whatever you want to call it. Okay. And that cycle is like a transverse invariant. I see. Um, okay. And so like Adam and Diana had used that like in, in the context of some spectral sequence, like uh, when does this cycle die? If it does die, you can get like a more refined uh, invariant called kappa. Okay. And then but that was not a transverse invariant, right? Um, no, wait. Right, I remember it being like, some, like it wouldn't call it a transverse invariant, but somehow it could tell you stuff about brains. Ah, okay, so it's probably finer than that. Yeah, but it'll tell you information about the brain as an element of the mapping class group. I see. Um, That's what's the other thing. Oh okay. yeah, and then there's like the like Grigsby Lakata Verily paper that I sent you, and then Lynn and I did something similar for uh -huh. a slightly different theory. Hey, by the way, what's Lynn doing this year? Yeah. She's at Michigan, um, okay. Ann Arbor. All right. Yeah. I I wasn't I didn't I didn't know where everyone ended up because I was in like Germany last year and then um, right. everyone like yeah. And then do you know what happened to Nate Dowlin? I think he's going into industry. He, he just left? Wow. Yeah. That's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I mean, I think he interviewed for the Tulane job last hmm. year. And I guess he didn't get it, but um, that's too, that's really bad. Yeah. <sighs> All right. <laughs> but Lynn has a job. Okay. Yeah, I think, I mean, her situation's sort of weird. Um, so they wanted to, like, she and Alex wanted to be together, right? So I don't think she has, like, a, she's not, like, tenured track right now or anything. But it's, like, possible that they're going to eventually open a line for her or something. I don't know, I might be putting words in her mouth. Um, I see. I don't know, is that, I don't know her hus husband is, uh, he was one of um oh wait i don't know who his advisor is but he's in algebraic geometry okay yeah what's his name Al alexander perry perry okay okay right. i guess i also wanted to ask you i mean it doesn't have to be right now like why you think it's true for ribbon knots and not like slice well, knots i guess you're working with the actual surface well, I mean, if it's, it would have to be a ribbon knot if, like, if it's, in, if it finds a symplectic surface. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I think that if you put the ribbon in three, I think you can just sort of, if you put the ribbon in three space, um, well, okay, let's go back. So, so there's, there's a paper on the Benekin bound by Etnayer and Jeremy Van Horn Morris, where, where it said if you're, transverse and fiber and you maximize the Benekin bound, then you're strongly quasi-positive. Uh, oh, okay. And so, and the, the issue is that like, the only thing that goes like, what basically what you want is to have like, only on the characteristic foliation of the cypher surface, you want to have only positive singularities. Mm -hmm. And that, that's like, that's sort of like being symplectic because you could just sort of choose some alpha such that D alpha is positive on the surface. Um, when you have positive genus, then you can have these, this essential annuli where you could have some negative annuli where you have a pair of like negative elliptic, negative hyperbolic. So you have this negative region um, on, the, on the surface. So you don't, you don't have only positive singularities. And so that's the obstruction. And so like, um, if you had an open book with root torsion or something, you could have one of these negative regions. But you need an, you need some essential curve on this surface. So when you have a when you have a, a disc, you can't have an essential you can't have a curve because any sort of negative region would have to be would force it to be over twisted. But when you have positive genus, you could have some negative region on that surface, um, and that's the obstruction. So, um, you know. From the in the case of the Benekin bound, there aren't the, the only knot with um, 
cipher genus zero is the unknot, so it's not interesting. But in the case of, well, in this case, when you're looking at ribbon surfaces, you can have some interest, you know, you might see some interesting ribbon knots. And I think that basically, um, the, you can't have that, like this, uh, this potential obstruction just doesn't exist for ribbon disks. Um, because you can't, there has to be only positive singularities um, up to canceling. Um, so uh, that's why I think it's true for ribbon knots. I mean, I asked Kyle Hayden this a couple weeks ago, um, and then I just um, thought I'd ask you to. Uh, and, um, but yeah, I mean, it would be really interesting to, to prove that every, yeah, like if you could, or, or whether you can characterize like knots which, which maximize slice Benneken. Um, And conversely, if there was a if there was a class in a symplectic four manifold where you couldn't make it symplectic, even though it was minimal genus, that would imply there's some knot which is which maximizes the slice Benneken but isn't quasi positive because it can't be replaced by a symplectic surface. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Maybe I'll think a bit about what happens. In, in like the difference between S Benikin and Slice Benikin. Because uh -huh. there are some results that's like, uh, we have these like more refined invariants and they take on this specific simple shape if and only if self-linking minus one is exactly equal to S or self-linking plus one is exactly equal to S, which means that the two bounds coincide. Um, right, so that would, that would be exactly what has to happen here. Um, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I write, so I think, oh, sorry, I chatted a uh, text. Um, yeah, what was, what did you say the, I forget, I always forget this, how these inequalities go. Uh, um, so S sub plus one is less than or equal to the S invariant, which is less than or equal to two times the four ball genus. So if, if the self linking plus one is equal to two times the four ball genus, then that has, then they all, all three have to be the same, right? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, that's the case that we're, we're thinking of. Yeah, that the like, you have a, um, I see. So the S invariant has to be, yeah, the S, yeah, okay. So everything is maximal. Um, and what is the, what, so what's the special form? Like I sort of, uh, so you had some characters oh. of, um, yeah, so if you look at the, the Grigsby Lakata Verily paper, uh -huh. um, I can hold it up. It's basically, for them, they only have one parameter. So it's it's just like, there's only one slope. It's it's a metric, um, kind of like Upsilon has the symmetry, but yeah. um, if it's quasi-positive, then you're going to see this shape like, uh, just like a single slope. I see. Um, maybe you can make sense of what they mean by um, I think I pointed to it in the email. It's like page 28 in the PDF. Okay. So they say uh, QP, well, smack in the middle of the page, there's just like this sequence of um, subsets. 28. Yeah, I was confused whether they were, I, I got confused between quasi positive and quasi alternating. Um, Oh, I mean, they d definitely do mean quasi positive, but I'm not sure if they mean like a transfer, like a there's a quasi positive representative. Like, I'm not sure which set of knots or or links they're looking at. Are they looking at smooth, transverse, or tell me which um, remark or like where in the page? Um, right under definition twenty two. Okay. Uh... So 
So So what is like I am, what is this S? What's that S? Yeah, oh. S is um, the set of transverse knots where self linking plus one is exactly equal to S, I think. Really? So. I want to uh, say this. Okay, I'm just going to go check. All right. um, sorry, no, it's a set of braids. I see. But that should be. You should be able to replace that with transverse knots, right? Because the only two pieces of information are like one of them is transverse knot invariant, the other one is a smooth knot invariant. I see. So they're claiming QP, whatever that means, is not is like a strict subset, but I don't know if they mean transverse, because I, I feel like that's hard, right? That's your question. I see. I think they just mean braid. Okay, well, no, if you go back to definition eight, 18, it says, where they find S, it says, informally, this is a set of braids for which the S Benekin bound is sharp. Right. Um, and uh, Ah, but it does also, okay, so S means that the S Benekin bound is sharp, but it doesn't mean that the like four ball genus bound is sharp. Right, in this paper, S Benekin is self-linking versus S, so. Right, right, so, yeah. so there, it looks like they're a little like, um, um, what was I want to say? Um, oh, so it could be that QP is where all three things are equal. Yeah, yeah. Right, like okay. SL, S minus one, and 2G4, or whatever combination yeah, yeah. of those things. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so yeah, so yeah, so um, exactly, yeah, that, that's, the, that's what I would hope is true. Mm hmm um, oh yeah, and then 29, I show you, that's the picture of the like quasi-positive. Um, it says it doesn't detect quasi-positivity, which I mean, you could have that, you could look like that even if you're not quasi-positive. So how, right. do they tell, how do you tell if something's not quasi-positive? Where are they getting these examples of, well, I guess if it doesn't, if, the F, if S is not equal to the um, four-ball genus or? Um, okay. I mean, if you, you can obstruct quasi positivity with a lot of things, because somehow you can prove, for instance, like the slope looks like this, it doesn't have any um, valleys, uh -huh. the, the S Benekin is not maximized. Right. You, you can start with quasi positive and prove a lot of things, but right. yeah, detecting is. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know how you would prove this. Um, I don't know what. Uh... So like the only time I've ever seen somebody like really be able to pin down quality positivity is like in Rudolph's paper, right? Where he actually goes between an algebraic curve. Yeah. And it's link um, and then goes both ways. But for a symplectic case, you don't really understand it using like an equation, right? You really, I don't know, like what kind of information do you start with if you, I mean, if you want to represent a symplectic uh, surface? Well, oh, so to go from a symplectic surface to a quasi-positive representation? Is that the um, question? Well, no, yeah. I guess I'm trying to say like in, in Rudolph's paper, you might say, I have this complex surface and then I'm going to take like a ball and intersect it or whatever. Uh -huh. uh, sorry, a sphere and intersect it. But in this case, let's say your surface is now um, more general. It's like, it's just symplectic in some symplectic manifold. Um, oh, sorry, are we working with, 
What type of surfaces are we working with? I'm confused. Well, I want to say like I have I have some ribbon surface, which okay, um, or I have some slice of yeah. No, I have a ribbon surface. That's, that's what comes up in my example. I have a ribbon surface, mm -hmm. which is equal to whose Euler characteristic is self-linking plus one. So that implies, and so what you should get is, I think this, that means that like this, whatever link should maximize the S invariant, it should maximize tau, it should like, um, I think that, you know, I have a, I have a surface that basically probably every, um, it implies that like all of my like slice bounds should be sharp, right? All of my sort of anything which, any, my, any homology theory with a concordance invariant should come out um, sharp. Um, mm -hmm. Like, do those, you know, does that characterize quasi-positive? Um, and, uh, Um, I guess, I don't know how you sort of force a symplectic surface to exist <laughs> or how you get some, um, I think you're thinking, um, you're talking about these like uh, uh maybe looking at the characteristic foliation of uh, i don't know what, whatever uh, just the general idea of like maybe scanning a surface and trying to see what types of singular uh, singularities there are if you look at it from No, what I'm saying is very fuzzy. Just like any time you have some some way of scanning something and then seeing in like the braid foliation sort of way, what types of singularities you have might be a good way to actually like analyze some random surface that you want to somehow wiggle to be symplectic. I see. Um, well, uh, I don't know. So. If you're going to try and do something that's embedded, then like your N, like that sounds a lot like the Ed Nyer Van Orn Morris thing. Like it doesn't seem like, um, like, you know, like the, the ribbon surface versus embedded surface, it would be really similar. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, if you know that everything's tight, um, I'm trying to look at their old. Oh, another random idea I had was, um, let's say we're trying to find a contradiction. What if you started with like any old thing that's not quasi positive and then uh, to the braid, you just added like a lot of full twists. Do you know if that like makes it quasi positive? Like if not, then could you somehow put enough twists so that all the homology theories think that it's really, really positive looking, but somehow it isn't? Um, oh. Because, uh, like, for example, I think if you add enough, well, I think, like, we're trying to prove this. If you add enough positive twists, Plummet of Skies invariant will just become zero. Uh, I mean, sorry, non zero. Yeah, yeah, but that's, that's not interesting because um, that's how you prove the slice Benekin in the first place is that you, you, take any, you take any braid, you add a whole bunch of positive twists, that destroys all the negative crossings. And, um, oh, is that how it was original? 
Yeah, I only know the proofs through Havana homology. So, <laughs> yeah, so the, basically what you do is you take you take any surface bounded by some uh -huh. transverse link, and you add a whole bunch of full twists, which you just add that cobordism. There's a cobordism corresponding to all those full twists. Mm -hmm. And then eventually that turns it into a positive grade. And then, um, and if you, you know, and you can even go further and fill it in until you get some torus knot. So like torus knots are like terminal in the cobordism category. You can always sort of like take a cobordism to a torus knot. And then, so if you violated the slice Benekin on your small thing, you violate it for torus knots. And that's why the, that's why the uh, Milner conjecture implies the slice Benekin conjecture. Cool, thank you. Um, yeah, so adding, adding positive twists. Uh, yeah, that's not gonna- Yeah, if it's gonna cancel course. out negative crossings, it's not good. Yeah. Okay, well, I guess I technically have a math 11-13 meeting that I should go to today because I can't go tomorrow. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm gonna go pop on over there for 20 minutes. Um, okay. I don't know. I mean, well, well, so like, like oh, okay. So I was going to say like, you can, you can extend it to, so if you, you have a surface, a ribbon surface to maximize the slice Benekin, you can extend it to uh, a surface, um, like a, a, a sort of like a minimal surface bounded by some torus knot. Um, and, uh, um, and I guess the question is, I guess maybe it comes down to whether that, like, you can, well then, but of course you can't make every, it's not clear you can make all those surfaces, um, symplectic anyway, so, um, Right, they're they're not they're non symplectic minimal genus surfaces. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Can you turn it upside down? <laughs> um, Wait. Is there any other ribbon knot? Um, and then you take the ribbon disc and then let's say there's some, yeah, I, I don't know. This is probably not what you meant when you said turn it upside down, but maybe it is. Uh, turn it upside down, glue it together. You have some knotted sphere. Oh, it's not even knotted. I don't know where I'm going with this. Yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> um, okay. I'd be curious to hear like what you end up thinking about. <laughs> sort okay. of. Um, um, I'll, you, see yeah. this, you see this paper by uh, Chiprian and um, what's his name? I don't know him personally. Uh, the one that came out today. Scale oh, no. of onion modules and with Ikshu Nathola. I don't know. I don't know who. It was, it was on the archive today, but they like, there's, there's this sort of like, uh, like who is it? Um, Orson Walker and Barely have this like common homology for links in the boundary of four manifolds. That Paul tried, I, I heard Paul explain some of this to me last year. Um, 
anyway, there's some like, I don't know if this is something that's in your in your wheelhouse, but it's like, there's like a Kovano Rzanski homology for four manifolds that is new. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've heard Paul give talks about it a couple of times. Okay. Um, I haven't read it or anything. Okay. Um, I'm just sort of, uh, yeah, I mean, I wanted to, I just wanted to email you uh, that if, um, you know, it's hard, there's hard turning out papers and if you have a project that um, you need help on and I, it's something in my, you know, expertise, I'd be happy to help. Um, oh, yeah. Um, so, uh, I've just sort of been thinking a lot about myself for the last six years as a postdoc and like, <laughs> like, transition to like making sure that like, I don't just like, instead of making it like trying to make a name for myself, just like being more collaborative and helping other people get papers. So, um, uh, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Um, I think there was, um, I think last year, um, John and I came to UG and gave a talk and then there was some idea that I had afterwards. And then I was going to talk to him about it, but then I got busy with other things, but maybe I'll go look no. back at that again and email you about it. Um, okay. I don't remember what it was, but I think he it, basically, he was trying to do like a higher dimensional version, but somehow the lower dimensional version wasn't really solved yet. And I thought that maybe you could just cut, like use a Legendrian approximation to solve this transverse problem, but um, it, I'll look at it. Was it this non-simplicity thing with Roger? It was with Roger, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't remember. I mean, they got, yeah, they like found non-transversely simple examples in higher dimensions. Um, that's the oh, thing. Oh, right, right. It's probably something about like, yeah, simplicity. So like, if you have two different, can you find like an annulus between them? So you actually like isotop it. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I'll, I can go look at it again, see what you think. Um, but I'm doing okay <laughs> right now. I feel like I'm a little behind yeah. with papers, even though like on paper, it looks like, I guess I should say I'm not very proud of my latest paper. So I don't feel like I've written a paper in the last year. <laughs> so uh, that's what where I'm at. Paper? Um, um, it was this, what is I don't even know if I'm up on website. It was just like, um, there was this like WizCon thing and we really wanted to write something really fast to, so that the people running the conference could have something to put in their proceedings. So we're like, what kind of results can we cobble together into one paper? I see. So it's like these two small results. Um, uh, on of homology related invariance. Is that yeah. really fun? With, uh, yeah, it was really uh, lame too, because like the conference was for symplectic stuff. Like we were working with like, you know, transverse knots and stuff in our actual project, but this paper had nothing to do with any geometry. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, well, you know, like Adam took a, took, took a run at like Kovano homology and trisections and maybe there's, I'm, I'm not convinced it's been completely explained Board, but if you've got other stuff going on, then um, you know, do that. Do do what like do what's most productive. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll just try to do stuff. Like, uh, but I do think it would be cool to eventually talk to you, John Ekram, whatever. By about like, I mean, because like everyone's here, and I yeah. I don't know if I'll be in Georgia for very long. So, what yeah. uh, how I what years have you been here? Going to be here? Like what? Did you get here in 2019? This is my second year. Okay. So and you have uh, I have three years? this year and next. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Well, uh, to the extent that we can help you do better, I want to do that. Um, so oh, thank uh, you. <laughs> um, yeah, I've just been like, I, I just like, but at some point you just like get so focused on yourself that like, I just like, I was just in this mode for like two years where just like, I gotta like do everything possible to get a job. And now it's like moving to Athens. Like I finally like could like, like deconstructed that mindset. And now it's like, I can like, you know, um, ready to start like 
being open to like new new ideas and new projects. So, um, but again, like this is a really tough time. So like, I'm not putting any pressure on you. Like you start teaching is enormously stressful. Life is enormously stressful. So. Um, I think, I mean, I, I'm personally doing okay. I know like Athens was struggling in a lot of ways, but um, I mean, I, yeah, I thank you for reaching out. It's, it's definitely just like an opportunity for me. I don't feel like stressed about it or anything. Okay. All right. Well, okay, I'm really gonna pop over to that meeting now to okay. see if I have to be there. <laughs> you not mean to. No, no, I, it's a choice, my choice. All right. All right, thanks for the talk. Yep, see ya. Bye. Bye.